of the uh, uh, premier local uh, conferences on uh, what's happening in high-performance microprocessors and uh, integrated circuits. So it started in 1989, it's held once a year in, uh, in August in Silicon Valley. Uh, tutorials, talks, and posters, they had of course to go virtual this year. Uh, there were 1,250 registrants last year, they doubled practically uh, this year. So uh, there's some, some hot stuff there. Um, so the tutorials, uh, they had uh, two sessions on uh, Sunday. One was machine learning scale out, which I'll talk a little bit about. The other one was quantum computing, though it's interesting, that's far future stuff. So in the interest of brevity, I, I'm not gonna uh, talk about that today. Uh, the first two uh, topic areas uh, actually corresponded with uh, uh, our uh, uh, on Monday morning, and I didn't deem them uh, important enough to uh, miss uh, research and uh, stand up. But the keynote was kind of interesting, um, and uh, I had to actually uh, look at the, at the recorded version afterwards because I also had a conflict for uh, that one. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, that. So uh, Raja Kaduri, uh, Senior Vice President at Intel, uh, Graphics, and he's got a bunch of titles there. Uh, but the title of the talk was No Transistor Left Behind. Uh, there was a talk in edge computing and sensing. Uh, there's, uh, you can see the sessions there, FPGAs with reconfigurable architecture. I actually- Kevin, was, I'm sorry, Kevin, the, the red ones are the ones you're gonna talk about? Is that what yes. Saying? Yes, I'm going to touch uh, touch on uh, the uh, FPGA's reconfigurable architecture. Actually, <clears throat> the FPGA ones were, were not so much interesting, but the reconfigurable architecture one one was. Uh, so the ML training and ML inference, uh, even though I went to it, I'm not actually going to talk directly about those uh, t today uh, in the interest of time. Again, so, uh, I'm yeah. curious. How much of the conference was about AI? A uh, considerable amount, actually. In fact, almost all of it, in, in some sense, uh, was related to it. Uh, in the sense that uh, AI uh, machine learning is producing such a driving hardware to such an extent that everyone's kind of looking at that. So on the server side, there was some talk about that. and uh, But on the mobile, even on the mobile processing, it's like, how do you... Uh, what kind of AI features are being added into the things that are being put into your cell phones and, and such. So, uh, but I'm, I'm mostly was uh, <clears throat> going to concentrate on talking about uh, uh, where uh, people, uh, uh, where they see the future to be and uh, where sparsity cropped up. Uh, very few of the major players actually are pushing sparsity. The one exception uh, might be uh, Google and their, uh, excuse me, NVIDIA and their uh, A100 uh, architecture, but it's only fine grain sparsity, uh, uh, two by two blocks, that kind of thing. Uh, of course, there's also Cerebrus, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, later. They have sparsity to some degree, but they didn't get into that heavily as to, to what level of sparsity they actually support. Uh, <clears throat> there are also three posters which uh, I think were uh, bear reading. Uh, uh, when I get a pointer to where um, I can uh, uh, put it up on the Google Drive, I'll, I'll put up all the uh, uh, the PDFs for all this stuff. There, there are also uh, the recorded talks, but it requires a login to get to them. And if anyone you know is interested in actually hearing the talks behind these things, uh, I, I'll try to make that available to you in, in some way. Uh, I can just, you know, share my uh, my credentials and tell you how to navigate to it. But uh, these these three talks kind of looked interesting because they were related to sparsity, uh, and uh, in particular the Gampu uh, one uh, looks like they were trying to to deal with uh, sparse sparse to a limited extent, but they were dealing with it serially rather than in parallel. Okay, so. <sighs> The, the first uh, uh, tutorial area was the machine learning scale out. So in, in their parlance, scale up means more intense compute on a chip. Uh, so uh, when you, you know, double the transistor count or you try to be more, uh, uh, you know, pack more functionality on there, that's what they mean by scale up. So 
uh, and tried to kind of uh, get to Moore's Law's equivalence, that's one way of doing it. Uh, the typical problem there is that uh, is you have a power barrier that uh, they, uh, they can only scale up by basically uh, keeping to a certain size chip and just packing more onto there. You, can, you used to be able to up the clock frequency and <clears throat> that's just too prohibitive power wise these now you, you'll melt the chip. Uh, scale out means distributing the problem. So uh, one of the things uh, that's becoming more and more uh, prevalent now is uh, rather than just having a single chip, you have a, what's called a silicon interposer, which is kind of like a piece of silicon with uh, uh, kind of uh, mating wires on it and you drop little chiplets on there uh, to add the functionality. In some cases, they're all symmetric. Some cases you have heterogeneous chips. So you can mention Ma Max uh, capable, uh, knit, mix and match capability. Are they doing that? Uh, is that actually in production now? Or is this like oh, yeah. the future? Oh, it's yeah. no, I mean, uh, your, uh, your uh, uh, Xilinx chips already have that right now. I mean, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, that technology has, has okay, been all right. Good for at least 10 yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just a question to the degree that they're relying upon it now. Uh, because the, the big problem is that as you, as you make the chip larger, your chance of hitting a critical defect is, is greater. So the idea is that, okay, we box everything yeah, off. Yeah. To this I mean, and this has been talked about for years. I just didn't know if they're actually doing it. It's oh, okay. a, absolutely. Okay. Um, I guess the extreme version of scale up would be Cerebrus where they had the whole wafer. Uh, yeah, wafer yeah. Is the chip. that's not even a chiplet. That's the, they just went to the entire wafer, you know, monolithically across the whole thing. So uh, rather than piecing together a good die, they just route around the ones that have failed. So yeah, exactly. And I'll talk about Cerebus a little bit in a bit. Uh, so the hierarchy is kind of the chiplets on the interposer die, and then multiple chips per board, multiple boards per rack slot where they kind of slide in those drawers and then you know multiple racks and now we're talking warehouse level compute where the entire building theoretically could be dedicated to one problem though in practice that's not the case uh, one of the other things that i've noted is that they're starting to put computation network switches so the communication paths between all these servers uh, now are it's not just smart they're actually doing some forms of computation on them in a way of either compression or some kind of uh, processing on the way to some other uh, 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 GPU or server in some place. So uh, there are actually companies that are now building these, these network switches so they have computation built into them. So the nodes themselves are compute units, not just uh, uh, the source and targets. Uh, so most of the talks were actually uh, case studies and scale out. So uh, in, unless you want to, you know, someone's interested in the hardware details of how they approached it, uh, I didn't think that would be worth covering this talk. Um, so the, uh, one of the talks that I thought was worth uh, uh, looking through, at least the slides of, is the Fundamentals of Scaling Out uh, Deep Learning Training. Uh, they did a very good presentation of what types of operations you need when you start scaling out you know, beyond a, a chip or a board <clears throat> what kinds of parallelism do you, can you do? I mean, the first thing everyone does is data parallelism where you have SIMD units that do, you know, a vector multiplies in one parallel shot. <clears throat> but at some point you run out of uh, uh, capacity uh, on whatever chip or board that you have. And so then you start subdividing in the model. So uh, you could either, uh, if we think of our DL models where, you know, they're, uh, you, what you would do is take a piece of the model and execute it all the way through on one chip and then subdivide that. So if you have, you know, uh, you know, uh, a thousand, you know, uh, size vector as a, as a kind of trite example, you might divide it up into uh, pieces of a hundred and then execute the whole model, including boundary conditions through the whole thing and then recombine it at the end. Uh, the other one is just pipelining it, taking each layer and operating it on a different chip and then shipping the intermediate results between chip to chip. And then all combination of these above. Now, what's interesting about that is that uh, when you look at 
how you want to recombine the results. There's various parlances of these map reduce operations where you, you would sum them all in, in one case where if you split up a matrix uh, a multiply, uh, there's, he basically goes into uh, what types of these map reduce operations you would use that you call at a higher level, both for the forward pass and sometimes it's different for the backward pass. And I, I think it's, it was a really good presentation of that. It, it opened my eyes to uh, what was possible. Um, so uh, here's uh, Cerebrus. They actually have a talk uh, in uh, outside of the tutorials, but uh, it was basically a more or less reiteration. So uh, Numenta has had a relationship, obviously, with Cerebrus. So uh, this is a wafer scale engine. That's you know the center section out of a 300 millimeter chip. Uh, excuse me, a wafer. Uh, so, I mean, those are the stats. I mean, there's incredible 400,000 processing elements. Uh, they claim that they experience no delays talking for one corner of the chip, uh, of, of the wafer to another. So whatever they've done to design the thing, uh, they don't consider communication to be a barrier that it takes you longer to access corner to corner than adjacent. So they have designed it to kind of make, to, to balance all that. Uh, but 1.2 trillion transistors, uh, you know, the amount of memory, I mean, these are the stats here. The interesting thing is, as I mentioned earlier, they support some form of sparsity. They just didn't get into it a lot in, in, in this talk. Uh, but they also provide examples uh, similar to what I was showing to you before about uh, a data parallel, model parallel, and the two forms of it. They actually show how they kind of map those onto uh, with their compiler onto uh, pieces of the uh, of the uh, uh, or processors on the, on the chip. Kevin? Yeah. Typically, uh, this kind of thing has a problem of heat dissipation. Are they relying on sparsity to reduce heat, heat or is that for some reason not a problem? That's a good question, and I don't have a good answer for that. I mean, I think when those things are in there, they've got a giant heat sink on them. Yeah, but, you um, know, well, traditionally, that was one of the major problems. Or something. Yeah. But even with giant heat sinks, so, but you know, by having, if they were relying on sparsity, it, it would be an interesting idea that sparsity not only gives you these computational benefits, but it also gives you these physical heating yeah. benefits. I, 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 I agree. They didn't, they didn't talk about that. Yeah, uh, they, they didn't. If if they if they did, I didn't uh, I didn't twig on it. Uh, but the thing is, is that there is a notion when you talk about this kind of level of integration. There is a notion of what's called dark silicon, where they can't afford to turn on everything on, on any one of these chips, and they turn off pieces when they don't need them. And it's possible that, you know, that sparsity gives them a leg up on that, but they also, uh, you know, if they run around something, maybe they'll use pieces of each of processors that go through. But it is definitely a, a huge problem. If, if this entire thing was dissipating power, it would melt. So, uh, yeah. Good point. Uh, so take a take a look at this. Uh, can you see my cursor up here by any chance? Can I yes. move it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so take a look at these stats. And I'm going to show you the only they would say about they have another generation coming down the pike. Okay. Basically it's 2x. Uh, so they're going to be going on the most advanced TSMC process. And uh, they were kind of cagey as to when this might actually uh, 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 be when they're going to actually do the reveal of this. But what is it? Are they in? Are they? Is these chips of this system being deployed? Is it deployed now, or is it still like in samples and people are experimenting with? No, the uh, the, uh, the 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 first version, the first generation, is available uh, as on servers that can be accessed publicly. I believe. Well, I guess the question is, is it being used? Has it been proven? Um, you know, it's like you know, Google ordered a hundred thousand of them, or is it? It's more like, hey, you can try this out type of stuff. I, I don't I don't know their uh, uh, deployment level. Uh, I can I can try going through the uh, the slides and get an answer to your question. Yeah, that's just interesting to know. Yeah, I mean it's, it, the question is all right. This is such a bold move to do this. I mean, wafer scale has been the idea has been around for a long time, and but you know this, these people make a lot of noise about it. The question has it proven itself commercially that such that people are it's well, deployed so, or is it, it's like still like we're hoping we're going to sell a lot of these things. You know? it, it, I'm I'm 
maybe it's a, uh, uh, Pollyannish, uh, a look at this thing, but, uh, I mean, they could just be sucking down investment dollars, but the fact uh, that we've gone to a generation yeah. two indicates well, that they're that, getting that some. It doesn't, that doesn't tell you too much. It tells you no, I, I'm, I'm saying, uh, I, yeah. that's why I tried to qualify that. Uh, yeah. the, the, the All right, if, if we don't know, we'll find out soon. Enough. Yeah. When we went there, they did mention they deployed, they had partnership with universities and all, but it wasn't clear if they deployed commercially. Yeah. Or if it was just... Well, it sort of reminds me of the, you know, the stuff that uh, the Human Brain Project was doing, and Carl Holland Meyer's project in Germany. You know, they had these things, it was available, researchers were working with them, but, you know, you could go log on and use them, but it wasn't just like commercially useful yet. And so it was a big difference between those. I don't think we have to spend more time on it. Okay. Uh, so the other uh, talk I found interesting was a talk from uh, Google uh, with, uh, they're talking about G shard. So the concept of sharding is anywhere, Anytime you take uh, a problem uh, in machine learning or whatever in some uh, uh, high performance computation and basically break it up into pieces and then scatter, distribute those pieces uh, across physical boundaries to say other uh, chips, to other uh, boards, to other servers, and then recombine and pull the results back. So. Uh, so they, they basically, uh, this, this talk was describing the language they had for uh, dealing with that and how at Google, it, 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 they have a flow from defining a model in, uh, uh, in TensorFlow and working it down through an optimization layer, downing through their optimizing compiler and then deploying uh, outwards. Uh, requires partial annotation uh, with pragmas in the code to kind of give it an indication of how you want it to uh, uh, break apart, but uh, there's a lot of it that's, that's automated and that's what they're kind of highlighting. I mentioned also uh, uh, Tens Torrent uh, is a company, uh, I'll talk more about them later, uh, and they have an express goal for automatic uh, process, uh, starting from just a PyTorch API and then distributing things all the way across uh, infrastructure of whatever you have available. So uh, I think there, people are trying to lower the barrier to uh, handling larger problems. Uh, one of the reasons why is this was a, a slide I pulled out of uh, one person's talk of uh, these are these uh, transformer-based uh, uh, guys that uh, we're starting to show an interest in. And uh, you can kind of see that uh, this is a exponential growth of this. So. So around uh, in 2021, we're going to, uh, actually we've already started to see uh, trillion parameter models and it'll just trend upwards into, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a frightening curve. Uh, if in fact uh, it doesn't knee over at some point just due to uh, availability. So there was a lot of talk about how in the world do we possibly handle this, this uh, gargantuan growth in, uh, in desired capacity for these uh, giant models. So the y-axis here is uh, the number of parameters. Uh, yes, it's so the, model it's the number of weights or synapses in our in our yeah uh, exactly sections in, in in billions in so. billions yeah so it'll be at ten trillion soon yes <laughs> in another year and a half yeah, yeah exactly and and so th this is the appetite you know so. Uh, uh, in one of the other talks and one of the keynotes they. Uh, we're talking about you know Moore's law and how these things are in different ex uh, exponential uh, lines, you know, ca uh, capacity, Moore's law, and whatnot. And one of the uh, quotes out of there was that, uh, uh, which I found uh, uh, amusing, was that the number of people who are predicting uh, uh, the death of Moore's law doubles every year. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's so. roughly in the order of magnitude of you know year and a half of the number of synapses in the brain. <laughs> um, you know, very obviously the architectures are completely different and the neuron model is totally different, but it's, you know, at a very coarse scale, it's roughly the size of a neocortex, human neocortex. Yeah. yeah. But what, what I find interesting about this is that the, um, you know, as you point out, people have been predicting the death of Moore's law for a long, long time, going back to the 80s. And, um, and it didn't happen. And the, you know, why didn't it happen? Well, they just got clever, more and more clever in how to use CMOS and making smaller uh, features on, on silicon chips and so on. 
And, um, and every time they did that, of course, they actually reduced the power consumed by individual transistors and things like that. Here we have a, a just sort of a different issue. And the question is, if you say like, well, you know, people, let's assume people are wrong about that, you know, the, the, this can't keep scaling. What will be the solution that prevents it, that allows it to scale beyond where people are imagining? They're just saying, well, we just do more of what we're doing now. It's not going to be able to scale forever. And so if you think about that, I was just sitting here going through it. We know of one possible answer. One possible answer is sparsity. And, um, and I don't know if there's others, but if that's true, that says sparsity will be at the center of all this stuff going forward, that it will be the, uh, the absolute requirement to continue moving this direction. It, it, it just puts, I don't know if there's other possibilities, but that's the only one I'm aware of at the moment. Uh, maybe Kevin you know, or someone else knows some others, but it's just interesting to ask, okay, how would this continue? You can't just keep doing the same. You have to do something. And, yeah, um, well, both of the keynotes basically uh, took different tacks on that. I'm, I'm covering one of them, and the, the other one is, is, is available too. So one keynote was from Intel, of course, uh, uh, just kind of a, as a spoiler, they, they see a, a path to 50x increase in transistor density. Uh, and uh, Google took the other approach, and they basically because. Uh, but you know, can we stop there for a second? Yeah. That fifty X is a power problem, right? Unless they have some magic that we don't know about. So they again, have they, that. That that might really be again hinged on certain um, optimizations of the sparsity, not just that they can make the transistors smaller. No, I th I think they were looking at at well, okay, they basically had the third dimension they can go into. But that's still that, a power problem, right? There's uh, still a power problem, but that if uh, if you can stack them indefinitely, if you can interpose cooling layers in between all of those things, so in that sense, you could keep on going. Uh, that seems that doesn't seem like a great solution, but maybe that would be it. Well, uh, your power yeah. dissipation is a function of uh, surface area, and if you can you can basically instead of being at a solid block of silicon. If you can break it up and increase no, the I surface, it. I, I understand that. Um, it's uh, yeah. Well, I it would be interesting. Okay, well, so that was one three dimensions with cooling, right? What's the uh, what's the other basic idea? Is it uh, this? Uh, there, there basically there are ways of uh, s stacking transistors as wires. And stacking them vertically in place, kind of like you know, taking FinFET but going uh, and and stacking in that. The other isn't one, that course, still doesn't that still beg the the question of power? It, it does, but since they're extended structures, uh, they can actually probably uh, uh, force either air or liquid through there to do that. Mm. Uh, mm. The other thing is uh, is kind of the chiplet idea, and they're they're, they're basically looking at uh, I mean, it only gets you to 50 X. I mean, if you think about that, that's, that, that's, that's only, uh, you know, five doublings or, or so. Yeah. So it's, it, it, it kind of runs out of steam at some point. Uh, Google's approach on the other hand was that what happens when you run out of, uh, out of room at the bottom to kind of use Feynman's, uh, kind of quote, and they're looking at see how they can go in the other direction, you know, to, to, uh, to vast arrays of things. And then being smart about that. And yeah, but that's still that's right. still your 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 uh, accumulative uh, uh, power is is still going to go up. You know, it, right? it it is. It's just that it, it's it is the power will go up, but it, it's it's not uh, it's not going to be a nuclear core uh, in a. No, small but area. you might you might have you know you know uh, some town dedicated to one running one model, right? It's, it's just, right. No, I, mean, I, I, don't, it, I don't. I don't. I don't view that as a. I mean, I, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Maybe that will be the solution, but it seems like a, not a very good one. But, yeah. So, um, Jeff, I have, an, uh, yeah, I have another answer to your question. So, you know, you mentioned sparsity uh, as one way we that will help give maybe a, yeah. one or two orders of magnitude, you know, improvement in the scaling. Yeah. Um, I think another big thing is going to be the cortical columns idea. Mm. Uh, the reason is that... Um, if you have the thousand brains theory kind of idea and you, each cortical column builds a model of the world, of its world and builds a predictive model of the world, I think that can be much, much more compact than a system that's simply storing every possible combination yeah, of things. Yeah, I, uh, absolutely and, right. I, in fact, uh, and, and that's gonna give, I don't know how many orders of magnitude. Yeah, more. so uh, that's, that, that's, that we, we might be right, but that might be 
you're right. And I, I guess I was thinking like, oh, these people are building these traditional deep learning models. You know, we're going to take, uh, you know, these language models and just make them bigger and bigger and bigger type of things. And, and um, uh, but you're right, that's a different breaking point. That's like, hey, yeah, throw out all those models and build them this way. <laughs> yeah, like, so I, I think that's kind of the hardware substrates which are improving, which yeah, kind of yeah, yeah. I was just looking, if you I was add thinking, algorithmic improvements or conceptual yeah. improvements, that could add several orders I, of magnitude. I was looking at this chart and it's like all about GPT-2 and GPT-3 or maybe yeah. all about it. But, um, and so I'm thinking, all right, given those models, how are they gonna scale? That, that you could scale for some bit of sparsity, but you're right, ultimately you, you would, might have to abandon these kind of models. And just, you know, you're right, of course, the brain is, is a super monstrous model and it, it doesn't take much power at all. So, yeah, so. I, I, I mean, no one's, no one's looking right now at, at, at the, the kind of moral equivalent of a dendritic tree with 50,000 synapses on it. Yeah. yeah. You know, and what kind of what kind of hardware do you need for that? You know, yeah. I mean, we've we've talked to Ray Neuromorphics, which you know has that you know very wide th uh, sparsity thing. Uh, there's also, uh, and I, I'm not going to cover them, but there's also photonic solutions that uh, manage yeah. to uh, to uh, do some amazing things. Uh, one of which is that if you basically have coherent light hitting a uh, like a diffusion screen, a diffusive media, that basically is kind of a that's your random sampler right out there. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So I well, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. I mean, so one hand, the extent that people can continue doing this stuff just by doing clever pieces of hardware, or the optics, or you know that that's not great for us. The extent that they really hit some that the way they're going to keep going is based on sparsity and and a thousand brain theory and something that's great for us. So. Where that I, I no doubt that in the end uh, we'll be moving towards the brain models, but how long it takes is an interesting question. Yeah, I, right, there's, so. there's a natural limit. I mean, uh, I mean, we hit 300 millimeter uh, diameter wafers, you know, uh, how many years ago, and they haven't pushed beyond that point because, uh, at, at you know, to build a fab for that is on the order of like three billion dollars. Yeah. So at some yeah. point, you just say no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, it's just, it's very fun and interesting just to observe this happening. In, okay. Well, you, you'll, you'll and, love and the next few slides. And we're, and we're, you know, we play an interesting role in this whole future. It's, a, it's a, yeah. Well, the, the, the next uh, thing I'm, I'm, I only have a few minutes left and I've got 30 slides and I'm on, on uh, a nine. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, and I, by the way, have to get back to my books. So like, you know, I understand. So, so the next one are more G whiz slides. So, uh, so let me just go on to there. Uh, so uh, this was the first keynote. So he lays out the scope of the exponential challenges, the computation needs, the power, the fact that we're ge generating a huge amount of data and you know whether we want to recycle that back into machine learning uh, is an interesting thing. So he lays out this roadmap. I don't show the roadmap here. You have to look, kind of look at the slides because it's, it's, it's probably about you know, 12, 15 slides to show that roadmap. Uh, so the no transistor left behind was actually a quote from David Blythe, uh, who also spoke at the conference. Uh, so he just wanted to give uh, you know, credit to where that came from. And that's the idea that you, you try to make each transistor do something useful all the time, if possible, you know, so that you, you don't waste resources. So uh, he went through, and uh, there's a series of slides, but this was the culmination of basically uh, uh, various levels of technology nodes where you digitize everything, you network everything, everything gets on the mobile, everything's in the cloud, and then you get to exascale scale where you have 100 billion intelligent connected devices, you know, and the amount of compute that's associated with that. So that's, that's a GWIS slide. I think the intelligence is not referring to the kind of intelligence we talk about. Uh, it's, it's like, not, or is he talking about AI or is he, I mean, true AI or is he just saying, you know. Well, they're trying to push smart stuff to the edge. I think that's what he's kind of yeah, talking okay, about. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, he has some slides where on, on, a, uh, on a graph where he showed, you know, where we're not anywhere close to uh, reaching and it was logarithmic in both dimensions where it was uh, human intelligence and super intelligence. So he's just going on, you know, synapse numbers and stuff like that. So, but I, I figured that was, that was not a really qualified slide. But here's the, uh, uh, Charmaine, if you didn't know what Moore's Law was, that's basically uh, 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 every two years, the idea was, was the, uh, the how, f uh, how much more compute power you can pack on, on the same area on a, on a chip. And that's, that's been driving uh, 
technology, at least in the digital realm for quite a while. But now uh, with these models, uh, we've gone to rather than a two year doubling, uh, we've gone to a 3.4 month doubling of uh, uh, required capacity. And so uh, also the data is exploding, the data that we're generating and we kind of go out in the world to get data to train these things. That's getting up to, uh, you know, by 2025, it's predicted 175 uh, zettabytes. Uh, that's what, 10 to the 15th, something like that, if I'm right. Um, anyway, uh, big number. But his claim was there's still plenty of room at the bottom and that was the uh, 50X. So a uh, couple of uh, uh, papers I just want to go through uh, quickly. Uh, this, this was kind of interesting uh, for a couple of reasons. So uh, he, basically the claim is, is that Bayesian inference uh, is not easy to do on conventional processors, so they built their own. Uh, the idea is that uh, uh, what you're trying to do is if you're trying to do something predictive uh, using a Bayes rule and Bayesian inference, uh, the fact that rather than having a, a point estimate, you have a, you're estimating a distribution. And in cases where you have incomplete data, this is, you know, given the available information you have, here's your best guess at, at doing stuff. Uh, so they claim to be the first silicon accelerator for Bayesian inference. Uh, they did a hardware uh, algorithm co-design with parallel, uh, uh, is it, uh, Something, something Monte Carlo, I always uh, skip, uh, Markov chain. Uh, Markov chain. Uh, and uh, so they, they applied it to some uh, uh, unsupervised tasks. And so this is what it is. Now, here's the thing that I find interesting. They use chip kit. They actually, uh, they have access to this technology where they have an incredibly short design cycle for something. This is from RTL to tape out in three months by five people. I mean, that's, that's incredible for something of, 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 of this magnitude. And if, if that's what's, you know, if, if that technology is, is really uh, available, I think it actually is, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna eat into the FPGA market. I mean, you look, you look at, at, at how long it takes sometimes to get to bring up a, a FPGA with all the algorithms you want. And part of that is you're trying to, you know, work within the constraints of, of, of the FPGA chip. But if you could just use standard library cells and do place and route and put things exactly where you want them in exactly the right type, you have a more optimal design. I mean, it will not be as, as, as it won't be necessarily repro reprogrammable, but at least it allows you to try things out uh, uh, with relatively low overhead, I mean, uh, in, in terms of resources. So this is just a quick picture of where uh, they started with the input, where they've knocked out some data or made it uh, credited up. And then uh, after some number of iterations, here's how much it uh, tries to know. This one, you know, you know, it didn't have much to really pull this together. So I don't think that against the baseline, it was doing, you know, a hell of a good job. For some of these other ones, it was doing not a, a particularly bad job. So it depends upon the problem domain. Okay, Ted's torrent. So they had a, a, a talk, uh, neurons versus NAND gates versus networks to find the right compute substrate for artificial intelligence. Uh, they have, I think, a, a complementary uh, or not complementary, but a similar philosophy to, uh, to Numenta in some ways, except they were way more hardware oriented. So they were founded in 2016, they got 70 people. Uh, they have people with a, a, a spectrum of backgrounds in, uh, in uh, architectures. Uh, their uh, ML inference and train <coughs> training, uh, they're looking at anything from edge to data center and they want general purpose, high throughput parallel computation. So <coughs> here's their particular uh, talk of where we need to be and where ML compute demand is. And this is, uh, this is the, the Moore's law for clusters and then for mega clusters, which would be like warehouse level uh, <clears throat> and uh, where we have to go and where Moore's law is gonna take us. So, you know, stating that there's a, there's a uh, problem, a mismatch. So their goal, I mean, ambitious is largest clusters ever. So they want network and computer in each chip and they basically want one device in PyTorch. In other words, they wanted to take PyTorch 
define your model in PyTorch and then have it scale out seamlessly across this level of hierarchy. So that's, that's their high level ambition. Now, what they have interesting is that they have this notion so, of- So uh, are they a software system? I couldn't quite understand it. When you say clusters, is it just a bunch of servers and they're gonna do the software for them? It's, they, they, do, they do both software and hardware, but they're, they're, they're basically starting out with this module trying to show they have a unique architecture and they're trying to show it scaling on out that the and what does that module do? Is it like a GPU type of module or something? Uh, it's, uh, let me jump ahead to- I mean, it could be like a GPU with some sort of communication skills. These, these are, in some ways it's like a Cerebrus in the sense that each of these are individual processors. You have memory on the side, you have IO coming uh -huh. in here. Uh, and this is a, I guess a connection network. Well, that's a uh, gruesome name. That's a funny name for it. Not a grace call. <laughs> well, that's 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 just the current incarnation. Uh, not, the, uh, that's not a warm and funny, uh, warm and fuzzy term. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. so here's how they kind of map things on out, where they basically take these guys into groups to define various stages. So if you remember the uh, model. All right. So they, they're building a chip. They're that, building a chip that, that it have, can be that is designed for this large scale. Um, uh, deployment. Yes, I mean they're okay. they're they're thinking ahead to how you would scale it out. All right, that's the answer to the super tech question. And so they uh, they basically say, how do we uh, 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 map pipeline parallelism and model parallelism, you know, onto these array of processors? It's similar in that sense to uh, Cerebrus. Uh, so Jawbridge was uh, the first prototype. Grayscale is their current one, and Wormhole is the next one that they're uh, going for. Uh, the, the noted fact here is this one's got 600 port, 16 ports of 100G Ethernet ones. This is designed to go into a, uh, uh, a network cluster uh, with an integrated network switch. So they're, they're basically proving their technology one step at a time. Why, why did you say this is sort of like what, what Nomenth is doing? Well, it seems much you, more like what- Basically, you know, I was answering your questions. I skipped over the slides that would actually uh, speak to that. So just, 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 here, just mention it briefly. I'm going to have to drop off. They, they deal with sparsity. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. That's interesting. So this dynamic execution uh, is where they can actually uh, have this control flow here. They do a sparse compute here. They have dynamic precision. You use the precision you need. And there's runtime compression of weights and activations, which is very similar to what we're thinking about. Like runtime sparsification of those. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and compression. I mean, we're moving in and out of- Well, once you go sparse, I assume compression comes naturally from that. Is that you have the right- Well, in, 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 in some of these things, they don't. They just, you know, they, they, uh, they, they basically take the, the sparse representation thing, blow it on up and fill in all the zeros and send it to their vector unit, you know, so mm -hmm. that it, everything lines up. So not mm -hmm. everyone, you know, does it smartly. Okay. Uh, so they're showing uh, the matrix multiplication, uh, they're showing the results coming out of here as, as sparse, but these are both. Now what was weird, and I, I, I went on chat, because you can do that on, on these things with these guys. They had a activation sparse, the weights were dense, and the results were sparse. Well, okay, but they were gaining you know 100x max boost. They weren't taking advantage of weight sparsity. Somehow he had this notion that if you had a cascade set of these sparse results, somehow you'd want to multiply them together. And I asked him what the use case for that was. And I didn't really get a good answer. And David Cantor from Google, you know, agreed with me. He says, I thought he was, he just meant this to be sparse as well. So sparse, sparse, you know, you know, uh, get, you know, new sparse. He, he may be thinking about transformers where they do a multiplicative thing between two activation patterns. Um, oh, to deter okay. So Thank maybe you. Maybe he's something it. like that. Thank you. Thank you. Because I asked him case, that's what it is. 100 x you know, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you can get it, you know, with, uh, with, with, with dense weights, you know, sitting there, then, you know, cool. We're thinking, you know, this could be sparse as well. So maybe it becomes a thousand X, who knows, I don't know. But, but I think your point is still valid because I think the bulk of the compute is actually the stuff going on against the weights. And there, you're not going to get the hundred X. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. exactly. But, well, so. this chart, just on the surface, suggests that they think they would, right? I mean, they said 90% and 100X. So 
you're saying you don't believe that? Well, he's, he's saying only in the use case of transformers where you're multiplying uh, activations together as opposed to uh, weights. Yeah, oh, here they only uh, have activation sparsity, not weight sparsity. Yeah, I understand that. But you're saying that I, I guess they don't understand transformers well enough so, or at all. So you're, you're saying basically they're not using this sparse, this dense weight matrix. Is that what you're saying? They're, they're not. They're not. Uh, the, no, most of the, so here they, they can only do dense weight matrices, and the bulk of the computer is in the multiplying against the weight. So you would not get the 100x there. But part okay. of transformers, they're multiplying activations with activations. Yeah. So, so, there you so can get this 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 figure I'm looking at it here on the right is, is you're saying is misleading is that right is, yeah is, yeah okay I okay. think so all right well I don't know what they meant but that's all my right. interpretation I, have, I I I am very apologetic I am going to have to drop off here because I just have a deadline today okay <laughs> so I can I can watch the recording again later okay okay right, well we can go on for a few more minutes yeah yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm a, uh, actually I only got three more slides after this, so. Uh, so uh, they claim they have full uh, PyTorch integration. Uh, they uh, saying, you know, you know, which flows they can take in. They basically use Onyx as the uh, lingua franca in order to feed themselves uh, into their. Uh, so uh, basically the, the notion is they, when they say a device, I'm assuming that they're, talking about that in, in PyTorch language. And it says, basically we can map out no matter what the size of, of the computer is, but I'm presuming they mean their computer. Um, and it says pre-trained models can benefit from their TENS torrent features. So that's their automatic mm -hmm. deployment flow concept. It's nice to see them uh, be native PyTorch as, as uh, yeah. completely, because most of the stuff starts with TensorFlow and then right. PyTorch is an uh, afterthought. Well, I mean, that's that's the feed of the model, but the uh, but they also take these other flows as well. So you know. yeah, but Onyx is very restrictive. Um, so if we anything that has to go through Onyx, it's hard to do something really novel there. Okay. Whereas with if it's just the, if you look at just the left PyTorch arrow, you know, with full support for conditionals and Torch script and so on, then that's that's pretty good. Okay. So uh, here's what they claim to have the uh, capability on. They have models ready for uh, these guys. Uh, here's where they're, uh, uh, they're imagining that uh, this stuff is going to be applicable. Uh, they used uh, some examples, I think, in, their, uh, uh, in the other slides uh, for VG, uh, VGG, VGG, yes, uh, ResNet 50. Uh, there's others uh, they, they're looking at, you know, deployment in those areas, but that of course requires pretty much, you know, a, other engagements, I would guess. So they say their public beta is on our development cloud on November 1st. And so they currently are doing evaluations of their, uh, of their product. So 65 watts uh, is what their Grayskull uh, runs at. And here's their BERT in, inference performance. Now, uh, they basically are looking at these notion of conditionals with light conditional execution, mixed precision, moderate conditional execution. That, that, that dynamic computation they mentioned over there where they, I guess they can switch between uh, various uh, blocks. I think that's where they're talking about the conditional execution. And when they can do that, uh, apparently they uh, you know, boost their performance by a considerable amount. But uh, even from the slides that I saw, they, they, they didn't really, it has to be in the talk, but uh, from the slides, they didn't mention a lot about what they're meaning about conditional execution, but it's something to look at because uh, that crops up a lot in places, either predicated execution or conditional execution, where the cost of, of, of taking a branch or uh, going one way versus another uh, can be expensive in a, in a lot of architectures. So th that, was, that was what I had. Uh, Kevin. Mm -hmm. What is the unit of measure there? What is the score? That's a good question, and I don't have an answer for it. <laughs> um, I just took I'm it as a relative measure. Yeah, I'm guessing it's inferences per second. Per second, right? yeah. That, that would probably be my guess, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was looking at that and saying, okay. So it's, uh, the like I said, you know, the, I mean, obviously these are just the slide. I'm, I'm just pulling from their slide deck uh, selected things. Uh, and these are just a fraction of the slides, but I just, just to kind of drive the story forward. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, 
I will uh, uh, post this up someplace and uh, super type to give me some place where I can upload the uh, all the PDFs. I can I can do that as well. Okay. And people can look at it. So. Okay, sounds great. Thanks, Kevin. That was great. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Think, Thank start. you. You're welcome. My pleasure. Anything else? Um,